What's up guys, it's Mitch here from the DIYrecordingstudio.com and today we're going to be having a look at the op amp builds that I did for my Cappy VP28 mic preamps. They were a really tricky build and definitely not for the faint hearted, but it was a really exciting and fun project to do, so let's get into it. <music> So you might be thinking, what the hell is an op amp? Well, basically the op amp is part of the amplification process of a mic preamp or a line amp and it's even used in the bus sections of famous consoles like the SSL and stuff like that. And if you're working with any kind of professional level gear, you can expect to see some kind of operational amplifier or op amp within that console or mic preamp or even EQs and compressors. Now this particular op amp design is very special because it was invented by Saul Walker in the late 1960s. The idea being that these op amps are interchangeable. So how they work is they have these little pins that slot into the main PCB. And then if one of them was to say fail, they're very easily interchangeable. And this idea is very, very clever because back in the day, on older consoles, it was possible for some of these boards to fry. So instead of having a whole channel strip or a fader section out of commission, they could easily swap in and out these operational amplifiers. So it's a very clever idea, but it's also integral to the API sound. The op amp itself is a series of resistors and transistors all bundled really closely together to fit on the circuit board. And this can make them a little bit tricky to build, but it also gives the API gear part of its sound, its distortion characteristics, it's these components, these discrete real physical components that give the API units their distinct sound, that sound of American records in the late 1960s to 1970s. And that's why they're still sought after today. Now the units I'm building are faithfully recreated by Jeff Steiger at cappygear.com. And I should tell you now that this is not a paid promotion. I've bought all this equipment on my own for these builds. I'm just really excited to share it with you guys. And if you haven't seen the rest of this build, I'll put a link right up here. And as always, please don't forget to hit like and subscribe. We're nearly at a thousand subscribers. So thank you very much to all of you that have subscribed so far. It's really exciting to see this channel keep growing. So for my preamp build, what I did was build two different preamps. This was kind of recommended by a lot of people in forums and within the Cappy community and the API community. So what I did was build the GAR2520 and the GAR1731. The GAR2520 is the original sound of the API. API op amps. Um, it's built after the original 2520 op amp that you would find in any API gear, and it should give you that pretty classic API sound. The 1731 is a little bit different. It's supposed to be a bit cleaner, I believe. Uh, don't quote me on that. <laughs> a lot of people recommend to start with a 1731 and a 2520 and then see what you like. I definitely intend later on to change these op amps. There's some really exciting uh, different versions with more vintage sounds and distortion characteristics that I want to put in these VP28s pretty soon. But that's enough from me. Let's get into the first build. This is the GAR2520. Let's get into it. So welcome back to another build, guys. It's great to have you back. First up, what you want to do is write out a list of all the resistors and components, and we're going to sort them all out and put them in place with their values. This just makes it a lot easier to find the right components and saves making any mistakes when inserting them in the little PCB boards. And before we get started, we'll go over some of the suggested items you might need to have and tools you might need to have, as suggested by Jeff Steiger. Um, first off, you wanna have a small conical tip for your soldering iron, the smaller the better then you might want a bench vise or something to hold the PCBs. I used my little soldering setup with some little uh, clips, alligator clips on there. That made it easy enough to hold the little PCB boards. You'll also need a magnifying glass, maybe one with a light built in. My soldering station actually has one of these, so that also came in handy. Some of these components and the PCB board itself is quite small, so it really comes in handy to have some kind of magnifying glass sometimes. You might also need a solder wick or a desolderer just in case you make some mistakes. But um, I don't have a desolderer. I've got a soldering wick or desolder wick, sorry. But basically, um, you should 
try not to make any mistakes, <laughs> hopefully. Um, but if you do, some soldering wick will get you out of trouble. But a desoldering station is actually something I'm looking at because they are so much better at rectifying any bad solders that you make um, and just being able to remove a part if you've placed it in the wrong position. The other thing you'll need is a multimeter, a screwdriver or something that narrow, like a small screwdriver, to actually bend the legs on your resistor and diode leads because a lot of these are going to be stacked vertically, or nearly all of them will be. And that should round out about pretty much the tools that you need. And once you've sorted out all your resistor components there, we can get the bag of resistors and start soldering. So the first ones you wanna place are these little yellow capacitors. There's only two of them and they're both the same value and they go in at CD1 and CD2. And then there are these five blue capacitors that also need to go in on the board and they all have different values. So you'll definitely wanna use a magnifying glass to check these values and make sure that you're inserting them in the right parts of the PCB board and they go on C1, C2, C3, C4, and C5. And as you put these capacitors in, make sure you bend the legs at the other end of the PCB board. And once you've got these all in place, you can flip the little PCB board over and solder these in place. And as you can see at this point, all of the soldering points are very, very close together and tightly packed. So you need to be very careful and make sure that you don't bridge any of the solder joints with any of the empty ones. Otherwise, you're going to have a lot of trouble later on. And what I do to make this job easier is solder the contact points on the far outside parts of the PCB board and then just snip the ones on the outside as I've soldered them and then work my way into the center to the harder to reach components. And then the next uh, part to install are the four diodes. And these can be tricky, you have to be very careful because you first up want to bend the leg that is not with the black ring side of the diode. So there's a black ring which is the cathode that it needs to go in directly on the board where there's a little circle. And then the leg you bend is the one on the side of the diode that doesn't have the little black ring. So make sure that you orientate these correctly and get them in the board in the right position. And then once they're good to go, you can solder each of the legs and then give them a snip. And then next up are a pair of transistors. There's two of them. Uh, BC560C, check that you've got the right ones using your magnifying glass and you need to install them at Q6 and Q9 and as always with transistors you've got to make sure that you install them correctly so that the semicircle part on the transistor matches the semicircle that you see on the PCB so make sure that you get these orientated correctly and once you've got those in place, you can solder the legs. And what I tend to do to avoid overheating the transistors is solder one leg on one transistor and then move to another transistor and solder a leg on that one. And then once they're soldered in place, you can snip the legs. And then you want to grab the bag that says Q3, Q4, Q5, and that'll have a bag of transistors in it. And they will be labeled BC 550C. And as always with these transistors, just make sure that you place them in the board in the right orientation and they need to be in at Q3, Q4 and Q5 on the PCB board. And once they're in place, you can solder each of the legs. Once again, I go from transistor to transistor doing different legs so I don't overheat them. And then once that's all done, you can give the legs a snip. And then it's time to start stuffing the board with the resistors. So there is an order that you should put these in. It's recommended that you start with the resistors that are in the center of the board. So we're going to do R15, R14, R8, R7, R9, and R13, and then solder those in place. This can get tricky as always with these smaller PCB boards. So just solder whichever legs you can get to and then snip them and then get to the other legs that you are having a bit of trouble getting access to. And then we're gonna install R16, R10, and R1. 
and then we can flip the board again and solder those in place. And then we've got this matched pair of transistors, Q1 and Q2, that need to be soldered into the board. And we're also going to put in place R2, R6, R3, and R4-5. Um, those resistors need to go in, and then we can flip the board and start soldering the way. And once that's done, you can snip the legs and flip the board, and here we go again. And then the last lot of resistors are these larger brownie colored resistors. They're half watt resistors. So they need to go in. And as always, just make sure that when you flip the board, you solder the legs nice and neatly and you'll be all good. And the last couple of components to solder in are these little transistors. And you want to make sure this printed side there faces the center of the board as you insert them on the PCB. And then once they're in place, you can obviously solder the legs and then snip them nice and neatly. And the last thing to do is to install the Milmax pins. And these are the pins that are going to insert into the main VP28 PCB board. And you just want to be sure that you don't solder too much up the leg of the pin because then you're going to have issues with them coming into contact with the plugs in the PCB board. And there you have it. That's the GAR2520 op amp. Um, it's quite a tricky build, but not impossible. Just remember to take your time with it and you'll come up all good. The last thing to do is a visual inspection and make sure that there are no bridges between your solder joins and that all your transistors are facing in the correct orientation. So I hope you enjoyed this build of the GAR2520. It's a great sounding op amp and it's definitely integral to the sound of the VP28s that I'm currently using. If you haven't already, please hit like and subscribe down below and hit me up in the comment sections if you want to hear any sound examples from these op amps. I'm Mitch from the DIYRecordingStudio.com and I'll catch you soon.